Welcome to the Mentor Forge Podcast. This is Cartwright Marsh, your host here at Mentor Forge. We're about guiding men into their purpose to live, to define who they are and what they want to do. Uh, if this is your first time, go to mentorforge.com and subscribe to my email list where I provide many things, products, challenges, things for you to grow and to live in your purpose. Also check out mentorforge.com backslash coaching dash men. Uh, this is where I do my coaching here in Birmingham, Alabama. I do this through Calvert and Associates. You can check them out. Check and see if you sign up for a session today on uh, mentorforge.com backslash coaching dash men or Calvert and Associates.com. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Well, welcome to Mentor Forge Podcast. I got a great guest today, John Stakely from Unbound Grace, um, a great nonprofit here in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, John, great to have you here. Thanks, Cartwright. I'm glad to be a part of this. It sounds yeah, like fun. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, John, I mean, we kind of, uh, you know, I, you know, I read a little bit of your bio. You from Texas, originally born in Texas, lived in Huntsville. Um, and if anybody sees his bio on the website after it, uh, he's got a dog named bear. Yes. Now yes. I think some people outside of the state of Alabama or outside of Southeast, man, I know why would someone name their dog bear and it's mainly <laughs> not related to the animal. So, you know, maybe clarify that for some people. Yeah. So, uh, my daughter named our dog bear yeah. and she knew that her granddad had a dog named bear. And her granddad also played for Bear Bryant. Oh. So, um, I think it is named after Bear Bryant indirectly because my daughter named oh, it. Oh, so it's yeah. like a grandfathered. It's a family name, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will I will say um, my, my eight-year-old daughter that named Bear is pointing at me. And yes. so maybe I had more influence than, than I expected. Ah. So... Me, hey. you maybe the I, one who came up with the name. Okay, so maybe it was more me than I realized at the time. <laughs> I I never, I didn't know anything about that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he blames it on you. Huh? Yeah, he throws you under the bus. I hear you. Okay, it's funny. We remember the exact same story with two totally different outcomes. Right. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, anyway, I guess I sh- some people, you know, who don't know Bear Bryant, it's uh, as an Auburn fan, I'll, I will mention his, his, you know, he yeah. happened to play at a school down the road or co- play and coach at a school down the road for a few years. So absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Two schools with a lot of great re- legacy. Right, right. Okay. Hey, sweetheart, I gotta, I gotta do this. <laughs> All right. We're, we're good. I'm You're good. good. All right. So speaking of, I mean, being born in Huntsville, Alabama, um, yeah. Get, what was, uh, John, what was maybe your earliest childhood memory? Oh man. Well, born, born in Dallas, but pretty much grew up oh, in yeah. Huntsville. So, you know, I, I remember, uh, being in Dallas, uh, we went to first Baptist church and as a, a little kid, just, in all of the size of the church. And yeah. uh, Dr. Chris Wall was the pastor at the time. And I remember um, hearing him speak and uh, on a few occasions had the boldness to go up and speak with him and super kind man. Um, mm-hmm. I remember our, our house in Dallas had a pool. That was a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, mostly grew up in Huntsville, middle school, high school. And um, mm-hmm. so Huntsville is really what I ought to be claiming. Gotcha. So who was some of your growing, I mean, you sound like you mentioned that pastor. Who was some of your biggest influences growing up? Well, yeah, he, he was a, an influence because he was in my mind, you know, like, right. the, you know, he was like Same. my version of the Pope. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I, I would say my family was um, a huge influence over me. I, I think of my dad as the the masculine figure in my life um, and my granddad's uh, one I called granddad and the other one I called Papa. They, they were enormous influences in my life as well. Um, yeah. Granddad passed away a while ago and then my Papa passed away in the last few years. Um, so he, he lived quite a long life. Wow. That's wow. That's crazy. Yeah. How old was he when he passed? He was 95. 
Yes. Wow, it's a full life right there. Wow. Oh man, yeah. And he he lived by himself the the last few years and was independent and still like he put a roof on his house in his late eighties. So he's uh, very wow. very stu- he should not have done that. Um, that was not yeah. a wise decision. But you know, who's going to go and tell him not to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's kind of the, been a that's a man wow are you uh uh would you have the skills now to go up and roof your house the the, the skills absolutely not <laughs> the bravery to attempt it uneducated yes yes uh, would, okay so you got that, that from him <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, you'll, you'll catch on to a theme of stubbornness um uh, in, in my story so gotcha okay so growing up, I mean, even in Dallas and then in Huntsville, how would you say, what was church like? Well, how, how would you define church? Yeah, so we, we were a family that went to church. That was very much a part of our family identity. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was not always the desire of the kids, you know, and I'm sure there were Sunday mornings when mom and dad were getting ready where they thought, hey, it'd be a lot easier to not go through all this, you yeah. know, get these three crazy kids ready and um, trying to look presentable, but uh, we we were a family whose identity was Sundays. You went to church, and there were other times during the week where we participated. And um, I remember uh, when I started getting a little bit older and started having some of my own thoughts, uh, where we talked a little bit about the importance of the church and how the the church was our home base. And there's other really neat ministries that the Lord uses that we can participate in, but we have to remember church is home base. And I thought that was helpful. Oh, wow. So was that part of your influence? Did you have that positive experience at church? So it led you to want to get a seminary degree? Or was yeah, there another no, influence that's completely separate? It, I mean, it was, it's all over the place. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I really enjoyed the church I grew up in, Whitesburg Baptist Church in mm-hmm. Huntsville, Alabama. Really good church, very strong. I enjoyed the youth group. The, the pastor, um, you know, there were times where I would kind of think, hey, when I get older, I'm not going to church. Uh, just yeah. kind of typical mindset, I think probably most people go through mm-hmm. at some stage. Um, and I, I, in middle school, was probably my more rebellious, early age rebellion. Yeah. Uh, you know, just wanted to do my own thing, one of my own independence. And um, my ninth grade year, very similar 10th, 11th, 12th grade, uh, I started to kind of see, hey, this is actually a really good, safe place to be and learn more what it meant to worship and to uh, develop more of an understanding of scripture and, you know, uh, not just attend worship, but participate in worship. Mm -hmm. So that was very formative for me. Um, Transitioning into the University of Alabama, um, I I wanted so badly to to play football at some college level and yeah uh, didn't know the feeling <laughs> didn't make, yeah didn't make the cut um, and you know I like to blame it on a, a shoulder injury but at the end of the day you know I, I had uh, looks from some of the smaller schools mm-hmm. and I, I wanted to you know play on a level that I thought was a little bit more competitive and um, ended up just attending the University of Alabama on the Paul Bear Bryant scholarship ah well, that was that was pretty sweet yeah but, you know continuing the theme of church involvement um my sister went to the university of alabama and was three years ahead of me and she was plugged in at first baptist church and so it was a real natural progression for me to get plugged in there and i, I still did crew and um, did ruf a little bit participated in some of those ministries but again church just naturally was able to be my home base even in college yeah. So when in that point of time, did you feel like you made your faith your own? Today's episode is brought to you by Thrive Marriage Lab. If you want your marriage to thrive, this is a great opportunity to use. The strong marriages are the bedrock of strong churches, organization, families, and community. This is a 12-month pathway for any of you that are looking to really have weekly engagement with experienced marriage counselors, not just one, but many. So go to restory.life backslash thrive to get on the waiting list for this great program that starts in April. That's restory.life backslash thrive. And make sure you put the word forge in the promo code to receive a discount on your monthly fee. Now back to the episode.
I think it was probably about my freshman year because, you know, you're thrown into this environment and you have the opportunity to really lean on and depend on Christ or you have the opportunity to explore your own independence. And it's, honestly, it's a lot like the Garden of Eden. And this is just kind of a small example. We'll talk about a bigger one later on in the story. But, you yeah. know, Adam and Eve in the garden, they were essentially saying, like, God, we, we know your way's good, but we want to explore our own way. We want to test our own independence versus total dependency on God. And yeah, that point in my life, by God's grace, I, I leaned towards God. And it was... A really neat experience for me. A lot of growth. I was able to plug in with a really good group of friends that that I'm still friends with today. Oh wow, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, and then so post college, what happened? Um, uh, I know you went to Beeson, came to Birmingham, went to Beeson. What point of the process, and what led to that decision? Yeah, so um, I went to. All right, graduated with a degree in finance and economics, uh, really loved um, the, the business studies. Wasn't sure what I felt like the Lord wanted me to do. Uh, had an opportunity to take a job doing pharmaceutical sales right out of college. So moved to Birmingham, took the job doing pharmaceutical sales. Really enjoyed it. Uh, the, the pace was fun. The relationships were fun. But I, I sat there for three years and would wait to see a doctor and then have a couple minutes to a couple seconds to visit with the doctor oh, wow. so on occasions. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to stand here awkwardly in this sample closet for an hour, I want to at least have a consistent, you know, two, three, five minute conversation. And after a while, I just, it just wore on me and I felt like I was spinning my wheels. And yeah. so I, you know, prayed a lot about, Hey, what's, What's next, Lord? You know, what do you, what do you want me to do with this? And always been really interested in working at a church, doing ministry at a church, and ran into one of my mentors, a guy named Don Admire. And Don, if you've ever seen him, you know he's he's six eight, you know, two two seventy five, yeah. and um, his stature doesn't even begin to compare to his personality. Just yeah, wow. really, really big personality, and um, it's neat. Uh, Don was, he worked at Southwood Prez in Huntsville and he was a big young life guy. And so he, he would come to school lunches at Huntsville high school Mm -hmm. and I would ask him questions and he developed a relationship, just a a really neat guy. And I I really noticed Don uh, had some really good biblical answers to a lot of the questions I had. And I didn't always feel like I was getting it in some of my more natural circles, so, you know, full full circle here, um, I'm going to a wedding of one of my friends from high school, and Don yeah. is the minister that officiated the wedding. And I, I talked to Don, I said, hey, I don't know what I'm doing with my life here. And uh, Don was like, hey, hey, baby, just come work for me. And I was like, I don't, I, I don't work, like, that's a direct quote from Don. Um, and I was like, I don't really work like that. But over the course of the next six months, um, meeting with Don, talking and praying about it, uh, I accepted a position to work at Covenant Presbyterian Church here mm-hmm. in Birmingham, and uh, it was a great experience. Um, so then we kind of, that point, we I work at the church, and I went in with the arrogant mindset of, like, I'll work here a couple of years, then I'll jump back into the business world and be yeah. successful and give all my money to the church, you know, and uh, the Lord was laughing at my plans. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a common theme, right? Between our 20 year olds, we, we tend to yeah. great ideas, right? About what our life should look like. Yeah. yeah. Um, so back up a little bit, it's something you mentioned that I, I'm really curious about. So was it, is it very natural for you to be inquisitive, to even challenge like um, authority and ask questions and, and really probe and think through stuff when it comes to big questions? Yeah. Uh, I feel like, you know, especially when we get into the theological realm, we have God's word and God's word is complete and sufficient and provides everything that we need. So I feel like we have the opportunity to to dig really deep. And obviously with the the guidance of the Holy Spirit, get a lot of answers. Not every single question we have is going to be answered. But, you know, I was asking questions that I felt like we needed to have a pretty good direction on. And so that's where I feel like Dawn was able to help me out and, and even help me figure out how to study scripture to dig deeper. Hmm. Gotcha. 
Okay. So that's, I mean, that's just interesting. You never took things at face value. And when you saw someone who was like an expert, you generally started then it's like, all right, well, let me get some answers to my questions. And so, and generally for you, it came relationally. Yes. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Versus uh, academically, even though you did go to like, so yeah, did Beeson come about through covenant? You started working from them and then, and then went to seminary for those who don't know what Beeson is. It's a, it's a, seminary here in Birmingham. So, um, yeah. well, cool. So, so what happened? So, um, so you said you're going to be there two years at, at covenant Prez, right? So kind of unpacked for things. I know you were there for over 11 years. Um, yeah. yeah. What was that experience like working for a church, you know, especially growing up Baptist, moving to Presbyterian and then some of the things that you, what happened. So, yeah, yeah. It, it was a, it was a bit of a transition to go from the Southern Baptist church to the PCA church, but it, you know, it wasn't overly difficult and yeah. the covenant was a very welcoming place. Um, but got into covenant, really enjoyed doing ministry. Uh, the, the relationships that were developed, the opportunities that those relationships provided to share the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was just, it was powerful, but I did get to a point where it was, it was either go to seminary and continue in ministry or go back into the business world and and pursue some type of business occupation. And just through praying about it, uh, felt like the Lord was leading me to seminary. And uh, man, I I had no idea of the challenges that I was going to jump into when when I went into seminary. But um, I I don't regret the decision at all and very much value the education at Beeson. And little, little side note, my, my, 15 second plug for Beeson. Um, Beeson is an interdenominational seminary. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not non denominational, they're interdenominational, meaning there's Southern Baptist, Anglican, PCA. Yes. There, there's a, quite, a, quite a bit there um, that they come in. We all come in together with our different traditions and we get to learn you know, what it means to be ministers of the gospel and also value other people's traditions and experiences and so it's it's a really neat experience yeah i think that is interesting you said it because the people i've talked to who who have done the program you've gone through it as well gotten a degree there it uh and for those who don't know a lot of christian seminary schools they can be very um insulary they can have a lot of echo chambers and in beeson what's unique about them is they really do value kind of a diversity of thought you know, the one way is Jesus, but at the same time, there is other like ways to talk through. And so that's, that's really cool. You get that plug for Beeson because that's what I've heard and, and people I know. So, um, yeah, so get, um, you know, what are some of the big lessons you learned by, you know, m- really ministry? I know, you know, in business, especially farm school sales, that was hard, difficult, which was what led you to then making the change. So what was some of the big lessons you learned from being in ministry? Oh man. Yeah. Well, so um I got uh I got married in 2007, started okay, Yeah, I meant to ask that. Yeah, so I, yeah, was that while you're working at the church you, you met your wife? Yeah, so I started dating my wife Heidi at the end very end, tail end of my time at the University of Alabama. Okay. And then we got married in 2007. I actually proposed to her on the roof of Covenant Presbyterian Church. Oh, wow. cool. yeah. you, you climb up in there. Um, so that was neat. We got married by Don Admire, who, who I mentioned earlier mm-hmm. at Covenant Presbyterian. And, and then shortly after that, started seminary. And, and during that course of time, you know, seminary is a great experience, but I'm, I'm working full time at Covenant, um, full time mm-hmm. seminary. I was the, the 12 hours instead of 15 hours. You have to do 12 hours to be full time. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I was I was surviving little very little margin for error. Um, but I was being faithful in in both work and my seminary education. Then we had our first daughter who, who we saw earlier, um, (laughs) bringing me treats and telling the the true story about bear. Um, But we appreciate uh, the cameo. So yeah, (laughs) absolutely. But the, the margin of error was that much more thin. And that's when I started to make some really poor decisions. So, you know, full-time work, full-time seminary, trying to be a decent husband, um, trying to be a good father. 
and started to, to deal with some of the, the anxiety and stress because I felt like there was always something due the next day. And I was always having to, to perform and, you know, write that paper or prepare for this event at church or teach this lesson. And, um, you know, also wanted to just enjoy some of my friendships and relationships. So the stress, anxiety uh, manifested itself in a couple of different ways. One of them was not sleeping well. And so, you know, my, my wife and I would enjoy a glass of wine um, every night and my glass of wine became a couple glasses of wine. And then it, it progressed to a point where I was hiding alcohol. Um, I'd hide it in the bathroom and hide it around the house. And, um, instead of just having a glass of wine, I would hold my glass of wine, you know, sneak off and, um, drink a lot of, um, vodka or, or whatever liquor and, um, then come back and hold my glass of wine. Like, Oh, I just had a glass of wine, you know? And so yeah. that, that became a habit that developed over a period of time into an addiction and, and the addiction, you know, again, I'm, I'm in seminary, I'm working at a church, I'm trying to put on this facade of everything's okay. You know, yeah. There's no problems here. You know, look at, look at me being the husband and father and all this. And, you know, it was a, uh, it was a very thin layer. Um, of yeah. facade. And, and eventually it broke. Um, but you know we can we can get into that part when you're ready. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, guess before we get there, I, I'm kind of curious, just you know, especially for my listeners who similar in the same spot, like how to handle stress. Now looking back on it, you know, how do you wish you handled it better? Because we're all like the stress is going to be there. It's going to sometimes you know lead to anxiety, and and we're meant to carry responsibilities. And so, how how would you say that you you learned how to handle it better? Oh, yeah. Yes. So look, looking back, um, you know, I, I guess first I, I should comment that I wouldn't change anything. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the lessons that the Lord taught me through that process are yeah. so dear to me and mean so much. Uh, I hate the heartache and the pain. And again, we'll get into that in a second. But mm-hmm. um, going back, how should I have dealt with it appropriately? Um, I, I would have had a circle of guys around me that yeah. I would have really been vulnerable with. Like I have, I have really good friends that cared about me dearly mm-hmm. that I did not go to initially and let them know that I'm struggling. Um, yeah. Let them know that like, Hey, I'm not sleeping well. And I've got into this habit. Um, my elder at the time was a med- medical doctor, dear friend um, that talked to him today, but uh, I could have gone to him and said, Hey, I'm not sleeping well. You know, what, what can I do with this? And he would have had very good medical answers for me. But instead, I carried it inside because Mm -hmm. I was tough. I was stubborn and I was going to get it done because I have enough willpower and I have enough drive to do it on my own. And I don't have to lean on other people. And so I would trust the relationships around me. Yeah, that is interesting as men. We think, yeah, self-sufficiency is the goal in life, right? That we, as masculinity looks like me being on an island when really, no, actually the, the more manly is actually stepping in and bringing others in in our life. And actually we're very relational beings and need others, and especially in those times. So man, yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I was not half the badass I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like we all think we got to fake it till we make it kind of thing. And that yeah. never leads down a good road. So yeah. So tell me, yeah. What, um, yeah. Kind of give me that next step in the story. What, what happened after that? Yeah. So the, the struggle with alcohol, you know, it developed over a period of time and it lingered for quite some time. So it, you know, there were times where I thought I was in more control than I really was, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, sorry. We'll let the coffee pot turn itself off over there. Yeah. Oh, good. Here we go. Here we go. I do have an editing tool, so you're good, by the way. Right. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but the, the struggle with alcohol, you know, it, it developed over a period of time. But one of my favorite quotes is by a guy named Samuel Johnson. He says, mm-hmm. the chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they're too strong to be broken. And wow. That's that's addiction. You don't realize that it's there uh, until you're already enslaved by it. Mm-hmm. And I would describe that as my experience. And um, mm-hmm. my my addiction with alcohol lasted for a while. And I continued to lie and cover it up and hide and manipulate. And mm-hmm. you know, I would 
I would keep the narrative in as many silos as possible with friends. It was one narrative with family. It was one narrative Mm -hmm. Um, wife. It was one thing. And, you know, as long as those didn't interact, I could manipulate the truth and try to manage it. But even that was a lie. Um, The the deepest lie that I'll, that, that I told was the one that I allowed myself to believe that I was in control. And we talked earlier about, you know, control versus dependency. Um, I, I thought that I could control things and that was not true. And, you know, it's the, the attic brain is just a, it's a crazy thing. The insanity that you uh, participate in over and over. I remember so often praying before communion, you know, God, I love you. I love my wife, love my family, love my little girl. Please release me from this struggle. And then I would go home, you know, later that day and, you know, drink myself to sleep. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, you know, and the, and the cycle was so repetitive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think that's a common trait, even men, even, you know, outside of, you know, alcohol addiction or either other addictions. I mean, it's just that, like, why do we feel that we have to say, oh, I got it figured out. I'm good. I'm good. Why do I, like, we present a false front constantly, Um, you know, and just your experience, where have you seen, um, yeah, well, where does that come from? Where does most men, why do most men deal with that, struggle with that, even just in, you know, just in general? Yeah, absolutely. Um, gosh, I think so much it's it's just pride. And, yeah. and even if we try to hide underneath, like, you know, false humility, I think even still it's pride bubbling up. It's it's our sense of we can control, we can control, we can go, we can do, we can, yeah. we can conquer. Um, we'll, we will be successful enough. Um, and, you know, I, I think you're right. It, for me, you know, I'm thankful that it was alcohol. And, and then later on, it was put some prescription pills, but you know, that it, alcohol, you can only hide so much um, and people are going to see it and they're going to know like yeah. the physical effects work are going to manifest themselves in a way that, that it's, it's the secret everybody knows about. Um, yeah. You know, For guys, it can be um, working, to the point that it's unhealthy or of course, you know, the easy one, uh, pornography. Yeah. Well, it can be the way that we pursue, um, stuff like houses, vehicles, lake houses. Um, you know, what, what are our motives at their very core? I think a lot of times our motives are addictions. Um, it's, it's the things that we desire or our addictions are the things that allow Um, some brief little bit of respite from the anxiety. You know, it's how we cope with the world that we've created Mm -hmm. um, because we think we can control instead of depending on the Lord. So yeah, Yeah. that was totally what was happening with me. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, kind of, you know, I guess there's really two questions here, but the same question, but like, you know, what, you know, why is it such a struggle as men to then be honest about what's happening in you, what's ha- what's going on? And then, but also like, so yeah, what, what happened to you? What led to that a big awakening and allowed okay. you to, to allow your family and your wife in and say, hey, I, I need help. So. Yeah, I, I, I went to um, my, my best friend who just fought for me. And, you know, it's kind of a cool story how um, we walked together uh, through another scenario with addiction. And then he walked through the exact same scenario with me in addiction. But I went to Jason Strauss and I said, Hey man, um, I'm, I'm struggling. Um, but it's okay because I'm better, you know, like just complete lie. But Jason was intuitive enough to be like, okay, we're struggling. And I cracked that door open yeah. and like, I didn't peek in a little bit. And like he crammed his foot in the door and wouldn't let me shut the door. And right. just love loved me through the process. And then an, another guy named Ben Walker. And there's a lot of people that, that were a part of the healing process. The Lord used a lot of people. Um, but they opened up lines of communication with my wife to where I couldn't, I couldn't keep things in the little silos. Right. And, you know, my, my whole little world blew up that when, when I drank too much, they all knew and they all helped me. They loved me by taking action. And, and ultimately, um, you know, me and you um, can get together over a cup of coffee later on and tell horror stories of some of the things I did. But um, essentially, I put myself in a situation where I, I woke up at Ben Walker's house and he and Jason were on the phone and they were picking which rehab to take me to. Mm. And I was like, um, what 
like rehab, like time out. Do we, we need to do this? And um, absolutely, we need to do it at the time. Um, the, I, I didn't didn't want it. Nobody wants to go to rehab. Um, people might need people not, might know they need rehab. But um, yeah, again, I, I trusted uh, Ben and Jason and I knew yeah. that they were loving me well. And so that's why I think rehab was able to, to help. Um, rehab is just one one piece of the puzzle, you know, gives you some cool tools. But, um, you know, I, I have conversations almost every day where people ask me if so and so needs to go to rehab. And, you know, it, it depends on what are the motives of the person that you're trying to send to rehab. Uh, so I think for me, it, the statistics on people that have to go to multiple rehabs is crazy. Um, I, I went once and, uh, by God's grace, I pray that it'll be enough, but, um, you know, so far, uh, it's, it's proved to be helpful, but these guys, um, love me so well that I knew that they were doing what's best for me and sending me to rehab and, and it was good, but you know, honestly, things get real when you get out of rehab and, you know, we can, we can talk about why, why Unbound Grace was formed afterwards, but it's, you know, a lot about the context recovery. Yeah. So yeah. What, yeah. What was the, um, I mean, oh, man, there's a lot there that John, that you kind of got me curious about, but um, yeah. So yeah, give me just um, what was kind of the big takeaway you, I guess, took from rehab and, and why it was valuable for you. Yeah, it was it was good because on a daily basis, uh, I had to kind of think through, like, who am I? What am I doing here? Mm-hmm. What does this mean for me moving forward is, you know, I, like, again, like I'm I'm working at a church and I'm in rehab. Mm-hmm. And so at least those two things don't really go together. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I was like, am I like, am I done? Like, am I out of ministry forever? Like, what's what's my life going to be? So I, I began to dig a little deeper and process those things. And in that process, I I realized that I had tuned out my emotions for so long because I had numbed them away with the the pain pills, the, the yeah. Xanax, the alcohol. And um, I had to re-engage with who I was and mm-hmm. kind of revisit my core identity. And, and that was such a helpful exercise for me. So that's, I think that's what rehab gave me, along with some practical tools that are helpful. Yeah. And what did that look like? I mean, just for my listeners, young men that probably in a similar boat that you are just like, how what did it look like to engage your emotions? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, you know, all right, this kiss is crazy. So <laughs> I, 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 I drink way too much mm-hmm. and I wake up at Ben Walker's house and I, I'm taken to rehab and I'm sitting there that night. Um, Donald Trump is elected president the day I'm in rehab. My, it just, <laughs> uh, my, the roommate that I was supposed to room with in rehab, like, and I don't like, I'm still like, where am I? I'm kind of, you know, a little foggy. And my roommate has snuck in heroin and overdosed and he's resuscitated. Um, wow. And I'm like, what's happening? Like, oh like Jesus, are you coming again? Like this is, right. this is chaos. Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, what, what is it like? Um, it is incredibly uh, humbling in mm-hmm. an appropriate way. And, and man, every, I think every guy needs that to some degree um, mm-hmm. to, to be in a scenario where they're completely humbled because you can, you can try to double down on your pride or you can let that humility let you explore your heart a little bit more. So what does it look like to engage those emotions? Like yeah. Donald Trump's president. This is crazy. Yeah. This guy's OD. I'm supposed to room with what's happening here. Like, yeah. you know, and then like, who am I? Um, and so I had to ask myself those questions, like in the midst of that chaos. And, and I had to, I had 28 days to sit and think about it and journal and explore mm-hmm. and read scripture. And, and that was, that was really healing for me. Wow. Wow, man. Huh. So, uh, yeah. So you get at what did recovery look like? I mean, what was the most difficult part for you? Coming yeah. So you, yeah. 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 It's, it's totally coming out of rehab because you know who, well, <laughs> besides my, my, and I ended up rooming with the guy 
um, when he, when he recovered. Um, oh yeah. And so he was a really like, uh, he was so likable. Um, just a really neat guy. It just, he struggled with heroin. Um, hmm. and, and there is not a single person here that's any better than that guy. And yeah. Part of the message that we, we have to take in humility, um, you know, hmm. whether it's the, the guy under the bridge shooting heroin or it's the, the big time exec that has whatever drug addiction, um, right. no, nobody is better than anybody. Uh, we just experience God's grace in different ways. Mm, that's so getting, good. Yeah. getting out of rehab, um, I had to apply sobriety and recovery in the context of real life when uh, my wife wasn't happy or when I was trying to figure out like how I was going to provide for my family, you know, got out of rehab, you know, no, no more church job. So um, what does this look like? Um, and by the way, I also just said goodbye to an addiction that I had depended on for years. You know, that, that kind of perfect storm is not yeah. the best environment to, to stop drinking. Um, so I, I did, I did okay for a while and I was doing some outpatient rehab stuff. And um, then, then I had a, a relapse uh, kind of a one-off occasion where I drank and, you know, that was, that was a big deal because it hurt a lot of people. Um, and then I ended up doing that two more times. And so that was the context that I think really helped me understand recovery and have a, a better picture of what it looks like to walk in recovery. Yeah. And so, you know, when we're working with people at Unbound Grace in recovery, we're not trying to provide sobriety. We're not trying to provide abstinence from anything. We're trying to provide spiritual health because yeah. in the pursuit of spiritual health, your sobriety is going to fall into place and your relationships are going to fall into place and you're going to have a lens to view the entire world your frustrations and struggles. So um, my wife, I, I remember so vividly, this was after the third time that I had drank out of rehab. And she was like, um, you know, I was like, I'm so sorry. I can't believe I did that. You know, please forgive me. And she was like, I, I forgive you, but like, what's different? And like, yeah. what an incredibly fair question for her to ask. And now here's, here's a little bit of a peek into the mind of an addict. Um, Every single time I told her that I was not going to drink again, I was not going to use again, I meant it. Every ounce of my being, I meant it. But yeah. I would mess up again. And, you know, by God's grace, I, I haven't messed up today and I won't. And, you know, we have the, the whole, you know, one day at a time thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the, the recovery muscles look different years into it than they do initially. And I was just thinking, like, you know, Heidi, I need to really give you a good answer to that question. And so as I was really kind of exploring, I was like, you know, I've tried this sobriety thing for you. I've tried it for our daughter. Uh, I've tried it for friends and family, but I haven't tried it for me. And that, yeah. was when the, that was when the pendulum swung. I was like, I have to do this. You know, if, if she leaves me and I have no relationship with my daughter and my friends and family go away, I have to still be completely free of alcohol and, and of using any kind of substance. Mm. And that's where it was like, all right, we got to do this. And one of the illustrations that really helps drive this one home for me is like you're, you're in the airplane and they have these oxygen masks and the oxygen mask drops from the airplane. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, the majority of the guys listening right now would think, OK, oxygen mask. Uh, I got to help that elderly couple. I got to go make sure that single mom with the three kids that she has help getting the masks on the kids. Yeah. And next, next thing we know, we're, we're dropped on the ground because we don't have a supply of oxygen. So what, what I learned, and this is not in a selfish, egocentric type way, but I have to put that oxygen mask on so that I can be the husband, the father, the friend, um, the worker that I need to be. It's, it's what empowers me. It's like for us, it's like going on a, on a consistent basis, like a rhythm of life to go to God's word, because that's going to be our source of life. You know, apart from that, we we don't have a whole lot to offer. But with that, we have we can give life to anybody we come in contact with. So that's that's where the pendulum swung. And that's when I stopped drinking, praise God, and ha have not used since then. And um, it it hadn't always been super easy, but it's gotten a lot easier over the years. Yeah, I imagine that's probably maybe a lot of the source of of your drinking was was that deficit you're living from that constant. It's interesting that you say that. Cause I, I like, you know, I was a river God 
um, for a couple of summers. And that was one of the things they always said is like in a rescue situation, who is number one? It's like, I'm number one. Cause I can't rescue anybody if I'm drowning. <laughs> like, you know? So it's just like that mindset, that shift of like, we're best serve best to serve people from a position of strength mm-hmm. versus deficit. So, um, you know, I'm kind of curious just what's your, what was your, fir- your experience like first time walking back into the church after rehab? Oh man, gosh. I don't have a specific memory yeah. of the first time. Um, but you know what? I, I, I had worked at Covenant for 11 and a half years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was, that was a daily, like, part of my life to, to mm-hmm. be in the church. Um, so it was probably really awkward. I probably sat in the balcony in the back and, you know, came late, left early kind of deal. I, I don't remember. I don't remember yeah. what I did. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty shortly after, you know, had to get back to home base. I mean, because... Mm-hmm even if it hurt my pride and I was ashamed and felt guilty of uh, all that I had done and that everybody knew about it, you know, again, cause you know, <laughs> you're not keeping secrets about something like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and it, it, uh, it was probably tough, but, you know, also kind of on a side note, um, you know, having been through Beeson at this point, mm-hmm. um, I had the opportunity when I no longer worked at covenant to, get to try out a couple of different traditions and enjoy that. And um, yeah. then, then our family got plugged in at a really good church. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, and then, so, I mean, when you finally came to that revelation of like, I got to take care of me, I got to do this for me first and foremost, if I'm going to be any value to the people I love and care about or being even in ministry and serve other people. So did that lead to then the revelation of, man, I need to start a, a place for addicts to come and to be known and to feel, feel like they can be honest. And what was that process like and what led to then now unbound grace? Yeah. So I, I thought it for a while because, you know, you, you have, you hear about these scenarios where somebody has like a life changing experience and their knee jerk reaction is to make their whole life revolve around that one experience. And so I was like, ah, I'm not going to be that guy. You know, that's, you know, I'll, I'm just going to, you know, go and do whatever I end up doing. Um, and, and I had a, a job doing some consulting that I really enjoyed. And, you know, it's one of, one of the things like, you know, you, you leave the church and, you know, some, some churches pay differently than others, but like, you know, we did one deal on this consulting job and I was like, do I have to work the rest of the year? Like, holy <laughs> cow, you know, it's, it's a different world. So I was like, I could live like this. Yeah. Uh, so, but I, I felt the Lord continue to pull on my heart and like process what I had experienced. And I, I got to thinking about like, what does recovery look like now? Like, again, we mentioned anybody can be sober in uh, the recovery, like as you're in the inpatient, like a Bradford, or for me, it was at UAB. Um, or if you're in a sober living facility or halfway house, they used to be called, um, you know, you, you can, for the most part, stay sober in these environments. But what about your real life? And I didn't see uh, the church have much of a presence in that environment. And yeah. I was talking, uh, you know, I mentioned Jason Strauss earlier. I was talking to his wife, Amelia, about recovery and just the rhythms of recovery and like what it looks like in the context of real life. And um, she was like, you ought to start something. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, we don't need we don't need another Christian ministry doing its own little niche. Yeah. Um and I started praying about it. And, you know, again, the Lord's laughing at me like, yep, that's exactly what I want you to do. Yeah. Um, so that's the the origin of Unbound Grace came from that conversation. And it's it has grown a lot in, in the time since then. But it really is just an opportunity, I think, for people to connect, share their stories, their struggles, to connect with other people in the process and ultimately get plugged into the church. Because, the, you know, my rhythms of recovery, I, I think that were so important to my health were um, Sunday morning worship, you know, corporate worship once a week, um, one-on-one meetings with somebody that I can trust, talk to, be vulnerable with, whether that's a counselor or pastor or whoever that is, um, a recovery meeting where it can be AA, Celebrate Recovery, um, Unbound Grace runs a couple different meetings, Um a meeting where you're with other people that have struggled to some degree with some life issue and they're willing to be vulnerable with it. And then like a life group, those four things, uh, if we can consistently participate in those on an almost weekly basis, 
And I think those are rhythms of recovery for life. And, and they'll, they'll kind of develop into different things through the years, but it'll always be um, that, that number one corporate worship that I think is so vitally important, which, you know, to a degree goes full circle on where we started. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You found that home base yeah. growing up and then, and then, yeah. And then encouraging people to make that your number one. There is something about, yeah, standing in a room where everyone's heart is one towards admiration, worshiping towards God. That's really cool. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, I kind of like to end with this question and I kind of already asked it, but I'm curious, you know, looking back, John, you know, if you could, uh, give yourself, you know, tell, talk, you know, give advice to your 25 year old self, you know, what, what do you know now that you, um, uh, wish you knew, you know, you wish you knew then? Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings yeah. and all your ways follow him and he will direct your path. Yeah. Um, like not just know it. Cause I could have told you that when I was 25, Yeah. but, but practice it on a daily basis. Um, you know, with, there's certain indicators that I can kind of key in on to tell whether people are serious about their recovery. Um, one, one of them is, are they doing recovery on their terms or are they trusting in the, the, the process? I'm not trying to be Nick Saban here. Yeah. Um, and, and there is no, there is no perfect process other than leaning on the truth of scripture, but if they're doing recovery on their terms, then they are not, it will not go well. But if they're doing recovery on the the terms of, you know, the trusted process, kind of the rhythms of recovery that we've mentioned, then I think there's a lot of hope because they're they're leaning on grace. They're not leaning on their own strength. So that would be what I would would tell myself. Don't don't do it out of stubbornness, but do it out of dependency on the Lord. Mm, That's good. Yeah. I mean, the whole, you know, very similar I mean, even in my twenties, just like the whole language of trust the Lord in your heart, I could say it too, but it was like I'm compartmentalized. Yeah, I'll trust you with that, but yeah. maybe not this. Yeah, you know, not my future, not my job, but I'll trust you with other stuff. Yeah. Um, and so what is you know, leaning not on your own understanding? What does that mean to you, John? Yeah, it, it means really? trust trust what God says over anything that I think or believe in my opinion. And, and I think you nailed it. Like we, like, I think all of us in, in our twenties could make this pie chart because things are more black and white in our twenties yeah. um, than are, you know, I'm 42 now. So, um, you know, like I, I could have said my pie chart was 90% God, but then there was this 10%, you know, like 5% was I'm going to do whatever I want with this little money I'll put aside. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I like going out and having fun with friends and drinking too much. And, you know, like we have this little pie that's just for ourselves. And that is the light and the darkness. And when we allow that darkness to continue, then it will take hold and it will develop into some form of an addiction. And then you'll end up having to come see me at Unbound Grace. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Oh man. And even, yeah, you just mentioned those four things that like what we need in life. I mean, like, golly, I feel like we all need that. Right. Oh yeah. Where we are. That's just so good. Like needing that life group, needing that one-on-one checkup with people, people we trust and value. Um, yeah. And there's something else you said, like in the black and white in our twenties, there's something I, I definitely, I always say like in my twenties, I had a lot of core values and convictions, but they weren't very deep. And now that I'm getting older, everything is much more nuanced. So my core values and convictions are much smaller, but they're more solidified. Right. Much deeper. So, yeah, that's cool. That's really good. Um, well, well, John, yeah, I'd love if you just give a plug for Unbound Grace and, you know, what you're doing and, and you know, give a web, the website as well and just kind of, you know, um, let people know just more about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Google Unbound Grace and um, just for, for clarity's sake, we're, we're not the ministry in New Hampshire that has to do with like horses. Um, we're the other Unbound Grace. <laughs> if you want to laugh, um, Google Grace Unbound because that's um, like a kind of a free sexuality type um, group that um, talks about some some gender issues. Uh, so we are Unbound Grace. Right. Uh, 
the Birmingham location and, you know, check, check it out. But really, if you do anything, check out the testimonials to see the power of the way the Lord has worked in different people's hearts. Um, I just, it's so moving. You know, it's, it's a joy to get to work with people and to get to hear their struggles and point them towards their only true hope, but also to get to hear their stories. So, you know, we, and, and I'll be quick on this, but like there's, you know, sharing your story is such an intimate process. And when people come in to meet with me initially, they share their story. And then after we've met for about eight weeks, they share their story. And it is, it is the same story, but there's so much more to it. And then um, in eight more weeks, they share their story in a group. And the story has gone from I am my struggle to I am not my struggle. I am overcoming my struggle by the power of Christ. And yeah. to see that story progress along those lines. So check out some of those testimonials because that's worth looking at. And then if you want to know more information about it, you know, you can find info on the website. That's cool. And how long have you been doing this? Gosh, we've been doing it. Uh, we're coming up about five years now. Five years. And what's really cool, it's there's, I mean, there's, like you said, there's those four pieces, but I mean, there's y'all provide counseling kind of just, you know, groups and discipleship and then overall just community to connect with that have been in the same struggles, which is like, oh man, how cool is that? Like, yeah, we all need that. So. Yeah. Well, everybody's addicted to something and everybody is struggling with something. And when you deal with it in isolation, it, it gets worse. You deal with it in community and you can experience healing. Yeah. And, and you're not limited to, uh, and this is my guess, John, and you can you know correct me, but it's like, you're, you're all not limited to ages or, no. you know, men, women, like it's, it's anybody who's dealing with addiction, right? Yeah. Anybody dealing with addiction. We, we have female counselors on staff. We have two guys. Um, we're really as much as anything, a community of people where we, we train some people that have a desire to give back to people beginning their recovery journey. And so, you know, it's even lay people that have a heart to help the healing process so people can tell their story of unbound grace. And it's really a story of God's grace for humanity. Wow, that's powerful. Yeah. Well, thanks, John. Thanks for coming on. This was a lot of fun. I enjoyed I really appreciate you sharing. So enjoyed it, man. Peace. See ya. Thank you for listening to Men Are Forged. Uh, this episode resonated with you or you thought of someone to share this with, please uh, please share on Spotify, Amazon, or Apple Podcast. And then Friday, uh, the video and as well as uh, highlights and clips will be shared on YouTube. So check out Men Are Forged on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. We'll see you next time.